I want to start this video by giving a huge shout out to Andy Dean, to Devon Ambler over on Instagram for sending me this camera. He reached out and asked if I'd like it as it wasn't getting much use and wouldn't take anything for it. So he just sent it on over. Thanks very much, Andy. Really appreciate it. Go show him some love over on Instagram. I've linked him below. In late 2008, Lumix released the LX3, and with it came notable changes from the LX1 and LX2 before it. So the LX3, much like its predecessors, has a Leica counterpart. In this case, it's the Deluxe 4, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. Despite these cameras looking very similar, there is a lot going on under the hood that's completely different, starting with the sensor. With the LX3, Lumix moved away from the 16 by 9 ratio sensor in both the LX1 and LX2, instead going with a more traditional 3.2 sensor, but with a twist. You see, while the sensor actually has 11.3 megapixels, it crops in every mode. So whether you choose to shoot 3.2, 4.3, or 16 by 9, you're getting approximately the same diagonal field of view and similar resolution with the 4.3 giving you 10 megapixels, 3.2 giving you 9.5 megapixels, and 16 by 9 giving you 8.9 megapixels. So you're only losing around 10% of the resolution by using the in-camera crop modes, rather than the 25% loss with the LX1 and LX2. The second big change that the LX3 brought was the new lens. The LX1 and LX2 both used a 28 to 112 millimeter full frame equivalent f2.8 to f4.9 Leica Vario Elmerit lens. With the LX3 though, you have a 24 to 60 equivalent f2 to f2.8 Vario Summicron lens, which gives you almost a full stop of extra light at the wide end and almost 1.5 stops at the telephoto end. Now bear in mind, however, that there is a significant reduction in the reach on the LX3 when compared to the other two, but you are gaining a little bit at the wide end. So while I'm mostly comparing this to the LX1, the LX3 does have much better ergonomics. I mean, it's no EM1 Mark II, but it has that grip from top to bottom, whereas the LX1 has the ergonomics of a bar of soap. Looking around the body of the LX3, you'll see some notable differences between that of the LX1 and LX2. While the button layout has changed, the most obvious differences are the inclusion of the hot shoe and the larger three inch LCD screen. And while the screen isn't gonna blow you away since displays have come a hell of a long way in 15 years, it's still a huge improvement over the 2.5 inch screen on the other two. As I do with the Canon PowerShot G10, I've been mostly shooting the LX3 in P mode, setting the ISO to base, which on this camera is 80, and just letting the camera control everything else with minor tweaks to exposure compensation depending on the scene. Now the main reason I shoot these cameras in P mode is because the secondary effects of aperture, the blurry background, isn't really that apparent on smaller sensors outside of macro mode. And so almost everything is in focus, even at F2 after a couple of meters. So letting the camera figure out the settings works perfectly in most situations. Now with that said, I do shoot RAW on this camera. It does have the ability to shoot JPEG, but they did remove the ability to shoot TIFF. So not really something I ever really bothered with on a camera like this, but just to let you know that it has gone away. Now, as with many of these older point and shoot compact style cameras, it does come with a bunch of scene modes and art filters. Nah, it's not something I'm ever gonna really use, but it is cool to have there if you want some fun effects on your images, or if you just don't wanna edit, wanna do it all in camera, you have that function there. Now, if you already own the LX1 or LX2 and are looking at the LX3 as a possible uh, addition to your collection, Good thing to know is that they do use the same batteries so therefore your batteries and your charger will work with the lx3 just as it does with the lx1 and lx2 
Now, unfortunately, these cameras have become quite popular in recent years. So the prices have, have, have gone up quite a bit. I mean, I got extremely lucky with the LX1. I mean, it's not in the best of shape, but I got that for 20 pounds. But the average price of those things at the moment, way, way higher than that. So if you can find yourself a bargain on any of these type of cameras, I would definitely jump on it. Now, as with all of these older point and shoot style cameras, there are, there are a few downsides with this screen although a big improvement over the LX1 still not the best it's not that bright so in bright sunlight it's really quite difficult to see what's going on and because it doesn't have a viewfinder you're relying on that screen to see your shots and your compositions of course it's not great in low light it does have an ISO range of 80 to 3200 but I mean realistically with a sensor so small you're not going to be getting nice looking images beyond about 400 ISO I would guess I haven't used it I usually stick it at 80 and use it in daylight. Now, despite their drawbacks and limitations in certain areas, there's something really cool about these little cameras. And it's not a nostalgia thing. I'm old enough to, you know, I've, I've lived my first at least 15 years at the back end of the film era, so it's not that. I just, I don't know. They're just a real lot of fun to use. And I think it's because you're not taking things too seriously with a camera like that. I mean, if I'm taking things seriously, I'm gonna get my full frame Canon or the EM1 Mark II, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do it properly. But with these cameras, it's like, I would shoot things with these cameras that I wouldn't shoot with the other cameras. And I think that's a big advantage. If you can get a hold of one of these, definitely get a hold of one. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.